grab your beverages and turn up your interweb. Solving the world's problems 12 ounces at a time. It's Dudes and Beer. was too long and they want to uh hit me with something so <laughs> anyway uh i am chris jordan your host welcome to dudes and beer tonight i have a very very special guest uh the great budini himself uh he is a magician by trade magician and ventriloquist of 62 years as well as the curator of an awesome online archive called cajun mystic dot com we have on the phone with us this evening uh ken Mio. how are you doing ken i'm doing fine christopher good to hear from you and good to happy to be speaking with you and everyone else who's listening i am so excited to have you on um i have wanted Thank you. to number one do a dudes and beer live from mardi gras since i started dudes and beer um and every chance i get i expose my audience to my cajun culture um, my mother is pure Cajun. I'm about half Cajun, um, and I guess not about. I am half Cajun. Uh, <laughs> and, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's okay. such, a, such a beautiful, amazing culture uh, that, like we were saying before air, has slowly started to wane away um, in the wake of America, and, uh, in the wake of progress. Um, and yeah. <laughs> at, at this time, all of these beautiful amazing stories these folklore tales from the swamp um from from cajun lore everything else as well as our traditions are slowly disappearing um and when i heard that i i put a call out on social media uh, to all my cajun family and friends that if you knew a three tour that i would love to have them on my show to talk about the history of um faith healing in, in Cajun culture. Uh, my grandfather wasn't necessarily a uh, traiteur, but he, he did a few things uh, that they did whenever we had earaches, things like that. And I was always fascinated by it. Um, and when I moved to Mamu, I had a chance to learn a little bit more about it. But even chatting with you just before the show um, was absolutely amazing, Ken. If you could uh, tell, tell our audience a little bit about yourself. Um, how you got involved with the magical arts, and uh, how you got involved with the world of the Treteur. The, the world of the Treteur existed here ever since I was born in this area. And every summer, almost all the children would visit the local Treteur to be treated for sunstroke, the prevention of sunstroke. And I suppose that not many people going to the traditional doctors unless something really serious is wrong, like broken limbs or something, they would go to a traitor for a fever, snake bite. Even when I attended once a traitor seminar in Lafayette, there was oh. a bunch of, yeah, there were, uh, it was a one night thing at one of, one of the uh, new age type parlors. And, there were several, two of them there that actually were called on at least three times a week to treat animals. And so that, mm -hmm. uh, when I was exploring the probability and possibility and what is happening here when people are treated and healed, anim uh, maybe it was a placebo effect, but animals have no placebo effect. Yeah. And the, and the traitors would heal animals. So, yep. so much for... You must have faith. The animals don't have faith. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, it, it, go ahead. A, and it, it, the faith healer is the closest thing that it really translates to. Um, it, I get, I suppose. Uh, that's it, uh, yeah, it does. Yeah. Well, this tradition of faith healing is not specific 
the Cajun country, the Appalachian regions, and all others have, and even in small French villages, it's practiced. And it's a, it's a strange tradition because it uh, has as many different rules and regulations, like mm, it can only be passed from someone older to someone younger, uh, boy, man to boy, or woman to boy, or woman to woman, or someone could say, no, no, you're wrong, it's this and that. So it has all the different rules, and it's too sacred to write down. It, it's uh, mm -hmm. No two persons have the same thing, and I... And, it is yeah. always said in French, 17th century French, and faith healing, well, th this might step on a few toes, but the research yes. I've done, <laughs> Peter, <laughs> is, combi is combining Catholicism, mm -hmm. Celtic magic, because Cajuns are traditionally, origin, the granddaddy of all Cajuns is Celt. We are French by default. So they brought with them in the traditions from Europe to Canada to down here, pieces of the Celtic magic traditions like working with knots, the broom, sweeping of the broom. All of these can be found in Celtic magic. Also included is African traditions from Africa, not necessarily voodoo, but hoodoo, which is relatively new in the way of folk medicine and Indian traditions. And... Now, you never tell it. You, here, go ahead. I'm sorry. Here's just a quick question. Just as long as we're defining things, is is a does a root fall under hoodoo? Like a root doctor? Well, well, a, a root, like a a spell or a curse that you would put on somebody. Would that? I guess that would be. Um, that would fall you? into hoodoo, right? That could, yeah. but yeah, that would that would fall. See, hoodoo has no deity. There is yeah. no tradition of worship of any god or a goddess or anything. It's just a, the application of, let's see, it's, it's oh, let's see. Trying, trying to formulate my thoughts on this. Yeah. Um, uh, Celtic, like I said, Celtic magic used knots. Traitors also utilize knots and ropes. If anything, it can be compared with, it would be Reiki. Okay. Reiki yeah. is very similar to the traitor traditions. See, like, yeah. in a sense, tapping into paranormal activity, which might fall into this, may not just be of a supernatural origin, but more scientifically, the ability to manipulate quantum reality fields. Now, I know we seem to be walking off of all of this sort of... Wow. But <laughs> you know, it's not often that you hear quantum reality fields with that beautiful accent of yours, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> but I can, yeah. I love it. Keep going. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, in, in quantum science, and I, I'm trying to tread softly here. That's okay. The, the mere knowledge, okay, let's say the application of whatever Traitor uses, in the participant's mind is sufficient to collapse a wave function and convert possibility into reality. See, science and technology may try to overcome time and space, but these applications, magic or whatever, that can transcend this already, but any objections, it's because Oh, that, that's okay. A okay, go ahead. Explanation of it, um, because <laughs> yeah. again, well, I I myself taught religion and spirituality for a long time, and tried to um, explain to people the the same way that my spiritual director, who was a Cistercian monk, explained it to me. Uh, religion's a great thing when taken in moderation, Chris. Um, yeah, you know, that's good. You know, yeah, and that's straight up from yeah. a monk. Um, and, and it was like, wow, uh, you know, when you think about that, yeah, religion is what you do in that building with those people of like mind, your spirituality is what you, how you enact that in your daily life. Um, right. and it, that, that's something that even a traitor would say, you know, where it's like, Hey, okay. So you've got these behaviors going on. You need to stop that. You're messing up your chi here. Uh, yeah. and, and that's, what's causing this illness. You know, I've known some traitors who, like one, his wife who's a traitor, has to go in a dark room mm. 
with a yellow flashlight. Now, she will not say what she does because in the tradition of Trita, power told is power lost. That's actually a Zuni Indian saying. Mm -hmm. Or mysteries revealed or profaned. So it's all very secretive, which is never written down. Yes. And uh, everyone, some might use some tobacco. uh, Yep. Slapped on the pit. I mean, every every That's every. My grandfather uh, used all the time. He would cut his cigarette <laughs> open and put it in his mouth and put it on our bug bites and then seal it up and like say a little prayer in French. You know, he'd do the same thing whenever we had an earache. He'd rub our ear and and blow yep. smoke gently into it as he as he said this prayer in Cajun and then he'd seal it up with a with a piece of cotton ball. And yeah, man, I'm, I'm familiar with that. You, within, within a day, that's gone. Yeah. I don't know what it was. Now, now not to leave it completely in the quantum reality field, of course, yeah. offering into the spiritual, uh, uh, like when I do it, there is definitely paying homage and honor to Christian deities. Sure. Virgin Mary, Jesus Christ, the whole bit. Mm-hmm. And I would not dare leave any of it out because maybe... I, I, my feeling on it is who invented quantum physics? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's that's a very respectful way to put it. And it doesn't necessarily, yeah. um, Matt, even, even if you, and it's interesting that you say that because even uh, a lot of people don't understand, number one, the difference between Cajun and Creole. Uh, they also don't understand uh, the difference between things like uh, Treteur or uh, regular traditional Celtic magic and voodoo. Right. Um, and voodoo is very much the the mix of um, high magic, things like that, African magic with Catholicism. With Catholicism, because of, when they were brought over... people do not realize that. They don't realize mm. very much a, a uh, Car- Caribbean form of Santeria in that way. Right. Well, there's a yeah, the, their practice, like from from Africa and different other parts, was a uh, sort of animism. Uh, it, it, what, what animism attributes souls to plants, inanimate, inanimate objects, and the supernatural power is what animates the entire universe. And their the ancestral worship and theater. Well, when they were brought here as slaves, they were forced to put down their voodoo practice and religion. So what they did was they saw Catholics worshiping saints and stuff. So they melded it in like we're almost like pretending we're converting, but on the quiet side, they were just still practicing their voodoo. But if someone would walk in, they would pull out the saints and stuff and saying the Catholic, the Christian prayers. And after a while, it became just a mixture of Catholicism and their native traditions, which is very interesting because yeah. <laughs> it's it's very predominant still in New, the New Orleans oh, area, and of course, hate, hugely. Yeah, of, yeah. In fact, more popular than ever now because like, I I don't know why. I guess just because people are beginning to become a little bit more open minded and well, and accepted of different and, traditions. You know, as, as someone who t- I, I'd I'd love to get your opinion um, as someone who is a traitor and does this. Um, how do you feel about that? How do you feel about, because, um, of course, as you said before, uh, and even as a magician, um, magic revealed is powered lost. Uh, you know, that those are things that, like you said earlier, are supposed to be handed down traditionally spoken word from person to person, soul to soul. Um, when you're selling it on the street corner, you know, um, and, you know, even because like, I tried getting somebody from the Voodoo Museum on, they never contacted me back. And I was so happy to have you contact me back because this is what I wanted. Um, yes. I, I love Voodoo, but I, I know tons about Voodoo. So do many of my listeners. So uh, this is much more in the closet and in the background, as we were saying on air, uh, just the fact that. Um, this is such a Bible Belt evangelical area. Um, even the and as I said before, faith healing is as close as you can get, really. Like definition wise, I suppose. Definition wise, especially in the Bible Belt regions of the Appalachian regions, it's probably strictly 
just yeah. uh, the religious applications. Whereas when you get down here, it's that mixture, like like you said, almost like Santeria. And uh, well, there are people it, it, who understand that there is an old way, you know. And you know, I remember my grandfather used to go to this guy, and he'd bring him a chicken, you know. And that that's one of the things that like people don't understand is that most of the time a tour is supposed to really insist on no payment. That's right. No you payment, know, but you can leave a donation because I've had vegetables donation, left at the door. Yeah. 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 You know, you can definitely mm. bring a bag of food from your garden. You can bring a, you know, mm. a pot of gumbo, something like that. Now, the, now the one that taught me, excuse me, but keep your train of thought. I just want to get this before I forget. Go, go. The one, the one that taught me said, you must never, if someone says, Oh, I have a headache. I must never say, Oh, I can, I can mm -hmm. fix that. You can't do that. But if the person says, are you a traitor? Can you help my headache? You cannot refuse. You have yeah. to help them no matter what you're doing, where you're at. And, uh, and what, what you need is the full name. And that's it. And, I mean, and, and then I do my work in private. Okay. Okay. And explain what you mean by what you need is the full name. It is the way that the person... It got to. I don't want you to reveal I'm, I'm, too much magic. No, I, no. For my audience I, I, I doesn't know what that means. The, the, the person that handed it to me, I, it was a tricky situation. There's hardly anyone left older than me. <laughs> and by the time I was ready to learn it, because I had always thought maybe uh, being a magician, I've always been somewhat skeptical and somewhat. Um, oh, sure. Yeah, it's just skeptical of it all. Appear out of thin air. <laughs> <laughs> and I realized as I'm studying, these traitors, they're shamans. Yes, it is absolutely they're shaman. a shamanistic tradition. Absolutely. And I said, if I have respect for the belief and the traditions of shamanism, well, let me get into this. And so by the time I'm looking for someone older than me, there's no one left. And I found one guy who was still younger than me, but he says, there is a blank one, meaning you can create it at, okay, let me see. When you use a, a system, morphic resonance can occur. And morphic resonance is a pattern of behavior that facilitates Subsequent occurrences of similar patterns. Uh, uh, God, let, let me let me ease that up a little bit. It's a, <laughs> any system Brilliant. any system that you use begins to inherit a memory. Uh, it, it like the hundredth monkey syndrome. I don't know if many people know what that is. You know, like if you train a monkey. Okay, one monkey is trained to do some, and then the next generation. It's trained the same thing, the next and third gen. By the time that generational process of training these monkeys, by the time you reach the hundredth monkey, he will do it without any training. Yeah. And that's called morphic, morphic resonance. It's repeats. Uh, and yeah. And what I did with this one, it took me a while. Nothing would happen for a while because I was developing it. And the only thing that I can reveal, and I just saw this on the internet, three numbers are very valuable in three turns. Forget how okay. Three, six, and nine. And I just saw on the internet that Nikola Tesla yep. said these were the formula words to the universe. Yep. Absolutely. Wow. Absolutely. And then he explained it with you. <laughs> oh, so you've heard of it then? Oh, right? yeah. Oh, yeah. I have. Most definitely. Is that like what it's like? Like. Even like beyond the golden me, uh, the, the yeah, golden, beyond, what is it? Yeah, yeah, beyond the Fibonacci sequence, uh, the golden mean. The golden um, mean, yeah. I, yeah. I know we, we fly, we're flying high now. So. <laughs> well, that's all right, because we talk about stuff like this all the time. I recently had the uh, founder of the Joseph Campbell Foundation on. That was incredible. Um, yeah, I have, this I have is, all the this tapes. Is yeah. right up the, this is right up there for me, because... You are you are so right, dead on point, um, with with the concept of a hundred, with the concept of um, we in today's society don't don't get this idea, um, and it's it's a very ancient concept, the concept of three six nine. Um, it goes all the way back to Kabbalah, 
Like if you there start, you go. If, now, if you start we, reading into we Jewish into Kabbalah, it. things like that, yes. like it's it's there. Um, this is the basis nah. of spirituality, and what people don't realize is that um, the whole concept of why we are different from animals comes straight out of Jewish Kabbalah. It's the fact that, according to the stories and most stories across the world, oddly enough. Uh, we are the only beings that were breathed into by God. The rest of yes. the rest of creation was spoken into being. We were the only ones created by God and breathed into by Him. And because of that, we have this creative power inside of us. We have the means by which to speak things into being. And the prime example is a guy, as you could go up, and punch a dude in the gut and be like, what's up, man? How you doing? And that's like a guy handshake. You know what I mean? Uh, yes. You, you go up and start talking bad about his mom or his wife. Let's see how well that goes over. Not only that, let's see if he doesn't hold that anger inside, whether you remain yes. friends or not. And that's the point of manifestation, people, um, yes. is the fact of you have now created that energy. What do you do with it? Right. That's right. And it's a it's a huge burden and sense of responsibility once you realize that, yeah, um, that's there. That's there. And to hear you talk about um, the input, because my, my grandfather always told me my lucky numbers were three and nine. And that's any time I play roulette, things like that, that that's what I throw down on. Those are my numbers. Um, but. It's it's a, been amazing to me as I study world religion, as I get deeper into philosophies, theologies, uh, numerology, things like that, and different forms of it, and different even studying different forms of high magic, um, even even things like um, Salamnic magic, you know, uh, Key of Solomon, stuff like right. that. Three six nine, there it is. All what the time. puzzles me is how could these ignorant and pardon the word, I didn't mean ignorant okay. in a derogatory no. turn, but like no, yeah, seventeenth century Cajuns, where did they get this knowledge of three, six, and nine? It handed down to them with probably yeah. it's mystery. Re mystery we revealed or profane. With, See, quantum physics tells us that nothing that is observed is unaffected by the observer. <laughs> we, we create our reality. That's right. That's right. It's and and that I say that all the time on this show, you know, the whole concept of science as we know it. If you've got an expected result at the end, that's not science. You can't have that's an right. expected result. If you have an expected result, then you're technically trying to disprove something, and that in and of itself yeah. is a loaded experiment. <laughs> yeah. That's right. That's right. <laughs> because you're going into it with the mindset of this isn't real, I need to debunk it. Instead yeah, of actively right. just taking points of data and not judging it, just looking at it for what it is. Don't care if it changes your paradigm. Don't care if it changes the rules of science. Good Lord, at one <laughs> point, the earth was flat. And yeah. Well, some guys say, yeah, ah, that's, that's right. round. You're a crazy person. Well, I got 45 other people on the boat with me that are just as crazy. We'll see you in a few years. You know? <laughs> um, and until that point, by all rationale, by almost every culture, Earth was flat. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's, that's so very true. <laughs> you know, except uh, for the Native Americans. With them, we lived on the back of a turtle. Still flat. Kind of a curve yeah. to it, but there is an edge. You can fall <laughs> off. Uh, you know, so uh, until that moment, all science that we knew, all knowledge that we knew that we had been told, um was that the earth was flat until we prove otherwise. My whole life, uh, I'm an astronomy freak. I've heard my whole life that there was not enough gr rotation on the moon to produce enough gravitational field to make water or condensation. Be damned if they didn't find a whole lake of water on the pole of the moon a month or so ago. It changes as they find out that they were wrong. <laughs> <laughs> And now suddenly every science book has to change because this is what we have called truth. Um, and, yeah. and that's just it. How did, how did becoming, at what age 
did you start the study of this beautiful healing art of the Treteur, Kim? Back in 1953, I had a book called Gumbo Yaya. Mm -hmm. And there was not much information before that on all of these unusual cultural traditions. And since the 1940s, a lot of my relatives lived in New Orleans. And my Uncle Bill, who was worked as an incinerator and garbage collector, had the backyard full of artifacts that he'd pick up from all over the city. Oh, wow. And inside some of these things, there was like, a, which I have today, a hoodoo hour incense burner that once belonged to a voodoo practitioner, and mm -hmm. also a unusual back in 1948, find a frame picture of a vampire lady. And uh, wow. all kind of stuff that was all attributed to the, the, the mystic lore of New Orleans. And being someone that leaned more into magic anyway, so all of these things really fascinated me. So I've, I've, my mind is so open, you can fall through it, but also, yeah. too, I'm very skeptical because, like, if... Uh, well, you fall through uh, some filters, but you'll fall. <laughs> yeah. But actually, do you believe in all that? Well, the word believe as used to a certain a knowledge is not exactly in my currency totally. I don't like the word believe. I like to just explore, just op open my mind and look for it, look yeah. for what's happening. Yeah, because once you say believe, then you trapped into a belief system and it's, it become, it's not flexible anymore. <laughs> Someone well, can present me with something that can say, "Hey, this is where you're wrong." Okay, I'm listening. Go ahead. <laughs> so you don't. So you don't think that belief can change and grow as the person evolves? Then you think it's a, a static, concrete concept. No, it can change and grow. Okay. Yeah, it can change and grow. Good. Uh, I hope so. Because some, there some, are things some, I yeah. believe. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Well, you know, you're sometimes a I think person too. I mean, sometimes I can uh, listen to my show. Sometimes I feel that truth is a personal experience and can't be shared very easily. I want that on a T-shirt. You did? No, I want that on a T-shirt. Oh, what I'm okay. saying. We need to make T-shirts of that, Ken, because that is okay. an absolutely beautiful phrase and so absolutely true. Yeah, yeah. Oh, this is wonderful. This is great. Well, and, <laughs> Where and, we going? For, for me, uh, like... Myself, uh, my, my first year in college, I studied as a seminarian. Um, and, and the one thing that my spiritual director always kind of pushed me toward was the confessional. Um, to be a confessor. Um, he was like, you, you have an amazing capacity for listening. And for just being quiet and listening and letting people talk and actively absorbing what they're saying, like emotionally. He was like, you should, you should really think about that, Chris, as a vocation. Um, and of course, I left the seminary. I'm married now with a kid. That was half a lifetime ago, quite literally. Uh, I was about 18. I'm 43 now. Um, but since then... Well, that... Yeah, go ahead. That's there, a wonderful piece of there, there are so many parts of my belief system um, things that I've come to just find true that, as you said earlier, uh, before the show and that we slightly covered that, um, a lot of the big reason that you haven't gone into this full on is because you've made a career out of being a magician and a ventriloquist and doing shows at libraries for kids and, you yeah. know, uh, doing birthday parties and special events and things like that. And as, as, Culturally profound as it is, um, even here in New Orleans, even in Metairie, uh, which I'm not, it, it, that is where you live, right? Is in Metairie? No, no I'm, I'm in the Vermilion Parish. Oh, Vermilion Parish, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm in the heart of uh, the Prairie Cajun country. Mm -hmm. It's only within the past 40 years that people have really not, it, there was a time when you couldn't walk down there. If someone met you, they'd say, come on, ça mon garçon. Well, I wondered sometime, what if I was from Pennsylvania and I was and, walking the street? And what, is what, that the beautiful, what does that beautiful Cajun phrase mean? Yeah. Oh, how are you doing, my friend, my, 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 my son? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It translates odd, my son, you know, but come, or, or my boy, come, come on, ça mon garçon. How are you doing, my boy? Yeah. One time I was in a, 
uh, I was in a, in a in a little convenience store, and a Cajun woman walked up to me. And I, I, we always assumed she's Cajun. She was living in in, the, in that part of the area in Iraq. And she says, "Mon garçon, est-ce que vous êtes sûr vous pouvez me dire il y a du poivre dans ce de?" And then I was, what she was asking me, "Are you educated? Can you read this and see if there's some pepper in this can?" And so I told her. But then I'm wondering, what if I was traveling through and I'm from Minnesota and I pulled up to get some pop, and yeah. this woman walks up to me. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you're, you're well, kind that, of in that, like, I spent a semester in Rome when I was, like, 19 years old, and there were places where, like, I spoke a little Spanish, so Italian wasn't tough, but, like, when I went to Eastern Europe and people spoke to me when I was buying stuff, I just held money out. I I hoped it was the right amount. I don't know. I want <laughs> that. Here you go. Um, you know, like, it's utterly that situation. Because, yeah, um, even friends of mine who come to Louisiana, uh, they're... They're surprised. I understand what people say. There, there are some thick accents. There are some, uh, some definitely thick dialects, even uh, yes. amongst yes. the Cajun language within Louisiana. Uh, and it's interesting, though, that this tradition, uh, traditions like this, traditions like traditional Mardi Gras, uh, yes, yeah, still carry on um, despite so much being driven out. Yes. It's it's almost like there is um and and God I hope there's a fight. If there isn't a fight, Ken, let's start a fight to save the art of the Tritur. Um because I, I really think it's something that needs to be preserved. It is something that, like you said earlier, uh we brought over from Celtic country to to the New World. The African, uh, yeah, from yeah. Celtic, uh, and, and com- combined with Catholicism, with African, with Native American Indian, well, all of it just beautifully melded together in in a concert that dances together. Well, and such a, such, really a spiritual uh, show of what the Cajun culture actually is. Um, That's that a fine mix, word, that, the spiritual show. I love that, that term, that, the spiritual that mix show. Of, of cultures, that 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 melange of things. Uh, like yeah. we said earlier, to to know that Creole is really much more here in the basin, you know, New Orleans, things like that. Um, there's some Cajun here, but most of it is really more Creole. You know, you're talking more of the people that came up from Haiti. Um, the Caribbean, things like that, mixed with the indigenous Indians as well as the people that lived here. Um, And when you're talking Cajun, you're talking the people that were exiled from Acadia. Right. (laughs) Now, there are different definitions of what Creole is. Sure. Like, one of the definitions is the firstborn in a new country is a Creole. Yeah, but that does, that doesn't sound exciting enough. We have to picture <laughs> Creole is a light skinned <laughs> mm. mulatto type, you know. No. Yeah, because actually, my grandfather always told my father, "We are Creole because we're mm. Moles, which we're not Cajuns, we're French." But of course, I'm Cajun all the way on every other my mom's side and all the way <laughs> back on my father's side. In okay. fact. I am so. I go back to someone named Abraham Mo in France back in the 12th century. So it's French. Oh, wow. We we did some research, and the only variant is a Castillo, which is Spanish. Yep. <laughs> Otherwise, and, con, 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 and that probably bull, came from got, right here in the New Orleans area, more than likely. Oh yeah, they came, right, right, <laughs> yeah. On the yeah, 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 <laughs> meaning you're Cajun till it stinks. <laughs> well, one time I was doing one time I was doing a show at the at a mall, and a, a fellow walks up to me and started speaking French, and I wasn't doing any accent thing, and I was just working. I was before Boudini, and I said, "Excuse me, sir." You walked up to me and you started speaking French to me, and without thinking, I answered you. Why did you do that? How did you know that I was, you could do that? Without me saying, sir, I don't understand what you're saying. He said, and this is the French, and I'll translate. Avec une figure comme ça, il a pas un tas d'autres qui peut être. He says, with a face like yours, there's not a whole lot other you can be. 
<laughs> that is a Boudreaux moment right there, folks. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then one time I'm a policeman in New Orleans. I was asking direction, and then he said, "You two go there, shot." And he was from Mamou. <laughs> oh, I said, "Well, how did you know I spoke French?" He said, "Your accent." I said, "I don't have an accent." <laughs> Can you imagine? Well, you know, when yeah. I auditioned for on television for Boudini. Uh, they were looking for a three-month job as primetime theater host. And they had three beautifully well-spoken DJs who spoke technically perfect English. Mm. And I thought I did, too. So I auditioned for the part. I was in a play in the Abbey, Abbey Players in Abbeville. Okay. And so Dave Pierce had said, why don't you audition for this three-month part? Because he had remembered me doing a show, uh, a 13-month episode of a horror show host. And so I'm doing I went to read a line, you know, tonight's movie is Clark Gable starring this and that. And <laughs> so they're playing, the, they're, they're playing the stuff for the board of directors. And they, they, uh. they, they first see these three beautifully spoken DJs. And then when my part, my time came up on the video, they all busted out laughing. <laughs> they said his accent, his accent is so thick, he sounds worse than Governor Edwards. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. And then Charles Charles Chatelain said, "That's the guy I want because <laughs> that, that's the guy." We're right talking there. about, yeah. He said we're talking forty years ago. So he said he, he's going to relate to a large segment of our population that's yeah. dying out. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and that's just it. Uh, like I, I remember working a corporate event in Austin one day, and this it, it was a huge oil event. I guess this guy from Oklahoma had gone down and visited one of their fields in Louisiana. And came up and was kind of regaling the audience with his Louisiana adventure and was, you know, oh, this coon ass was over there doing, and I'm like, I started telling his handler, like, uh, you do know that, like, it's kind of a derogatory term, like, you know, like, we say it, but, you know, <laughs> just, yeah. just saying, that that's straight up calling somebody ignorant. Yeah, that's straight up. Yeah, you know what? I, I, on one of my shows, well, the, the Protean Planet, I had rigged it up as a spaceship, and I was a Cajun in space. And I, I, a lot of workers offshore would watch us, adults, and they said, "Let's put on the Cajun coon astronaut." <laughs> yeah, the Cajun coon, coon astronaut. <laughs> coon astronaut, <laughs> and I had never heard that term before. And uh, they'd watch it, you know. Uh, so it, it was it was quite a popular show. <laughs> well, and let's get into that a little bit because we've we've talked about, um, and I'm sure we'll return to the topic of Tour, But uh, how did you get? Because uh, I always I I don't have the dexterity for press to digitation, um, I, I for magic. Mm -hmm. For sleight of hand, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, how did you get into the world of magic and uh, performance? There was a magician here called Willard the Wizard, who he was from. He was educated in Fort uh, Forkett Island or Cameron. They were from Scotland, Ireland, and they toured this area. They were Scotch Irish, and I got to see. I heard many stories as a child. Magician Willard the Wizard, and I finally got to see Willard the Wizard, and I, I guess suppose I was always fascinated with the strange. I remember you are familiar with the little hand gesture. This is the church. This is the steeple. Oh yeah. Open the door. Okay. I was yeah, four years old, and it was it was on a rainy afternoon at one of the first houses we lived in. And my cousin, Dick, we was standing on the porch and he showed me that little hand thing. And I saw the church, I saw the people in my mind, and I was so fascinated that with a story and your hands, you could do something to the Wow. And that probably, there is a saying that in every child's life, a door opens somewhere and lets mm. the future in. And I say, mm. well, that was probably my door that opened up. And I've always yeah. been interested in the bizarre, yeah. the supernatural, and 
Okay. And that was it. Yeah. Yeah. I began doing shows around 16, traveling uh, pretty much age, all over the what place. Age yeah. did you, what age did you start practicing magic? What age did you start studying? Uh, for, uh, 15. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Before, before then, I didn't think you could practice magic. See, where I live, it's not exactly in the swamps, but it, there are no books on magic. There was no... Yeah. No, no men, no one who would meant uh, let me be a, a student. There was nothing, and back in the back of comic books back then in the forties, there was always these ads: "Be a magician catalog, ten cents." And I sent away for that, and they were not very impressive props like finger chopper or things like that. But yeah. there was one book, a pamphlet type book, even though the advertisement advertised it as a huge tome. But it yeah. was just a pamphlet. And <laughs> it was like but eight one, pages. <laughs> yeah, well, right. It was a Johnson Smith catalog, actually. <laughs> and <laughs> I learned one sort of hand stunt. If you're a magician, if you started a little bit, it's called the French drop. It is where you can make a coin disappear. And I said, how in the world can that convince anyone that this disappeared. And so there was workers in the yard one day and I was working with them. And I was 15 years, oh, no, I was 13, I'm sorry. Even though I didn't start doing shows till 15. I did the French drop. And they were so fascinated, they called the other workers and they said, well, you know, it said never do the same trick twice. <laughs> but I did it and they were stunned. Then one day there was a, a bunch of football players out by the school and it was at night and they were mixed with the regular people and someone said, is that that guy, he's the one that can do the tricks? And I was, well, I'm going to try to avoid them because I don't want to do this. Too many people will be surrounded. But I thought to pick up a, a rock and I palmed it, you know, a palm, yeah, yeah. you know, where you can't see it in your hand. And so they called me and I made like, oh, I made like I hadn't heard them. Hey, how you doing? Yeah, can you make a uh, make this quarter disappear? Oh, and I said, that's kind of hard. And I keep in mind, I had a rock concealed <laughs> already. So I took the quarter and I said, tell you what, I'm going to put my hand around this metal pole. And I'm going to put the quarter. And what I did was I switched <laughs> <laughs> the big old rock for the quarter. And I tapped the edge of the rock onto the metal pole so that you could hear bang, bang, bang. Naturally, that's the quarter making a noise. Yeah. Without them seeing, I ditched the quarter in the pocket because it's, there's no quarter in my hand. They, they heard it in my hand. And I grabbed my wrist and round up so, so I can't put it in my pocket or anything. And it was, it was at night, so it was kind of, I kind of got away with a little bit subterfuge there. And I tapped it again. It says, you can't make it disappear now. We got you with you with the hole in my wrist. I said, you're right. No, let me see if I can make a change. And when I opened my hand, there was that rock. I thought they'd go crazy. You know, oh, my God. They're screaming. Oh my God. But then that so after funny. that, after that, they say, hey, come turn this into a rock. No, I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Then one too puzzling much. time, too much. I'm too tired. To I, was try- <laughs> I was trying, I was trying, I was trying to palm different things. And one time I was palming a kumquat, which is wrong and very yeah, hard yeah. to palm. So I'm walking, I was, the bell had rung and I was walking and his name was Luther. And he said, Hey, hey, stop, stop. Do a trick for me. I said, I don't have time. He says, look, produce something for me. And so help me. God was on my side. He said, produce a kumquat for me. Oh my God. <laughs> You got to be kidding. Oh my God. I rub my hands together. Boop, there's a kumquat. He looked at it, took it, popped it in his mouth, and walked off. I mean, he's a magician, huh? So what's the big deal? <laughs> <laughs> so my reputation uh, preceded me with all kinds of things. Some said, you know, I saw that. I saw him levitate once, which I never did. But, <laughs> you know, it's sort of like, uh, uh, what's this? And the guy on TV, uh, standing up and everything. Anyway, it's some things. And then one, one time I was driving down the street and at night and uh, his name was 
Frio, Dalton Frio, or Randall Frio. And he gives one of those high-pitched whistles, come see. And I pull up, this is about 11 o'clock at night. I was coming back from drinking and stuff, you know, and he says, he was standing in front of a bar. He said, Kenan, you never showed me any magic. I want to see what you can do. And I had nothing that I could do. Right about that time, I turned to the north, and up in the sky was the biggest display of meteorite activity I had ever seen. Looked like five or six pieces. You've seen beautiful oh, displays yeah. of meteor. Oh, yeah. And I, as I'm looking to him, I turn, I said, look. And he turns and he looks. And he says, look at what, Ken? I said, you didn't see that in the sky? No. What are you trying to do, Kenneth? Play with my mind? <laughs> and he backed off and went in the bar, scared. Later, he told people, I was standing on the street, and Kenneth comes by. He pulls up, and he says, Randall, I never showed you any magic, did I? Now, that's not true at all. That's not the way it happened. This is how he's telling it. He says, Randall, I want you to look in the sky and keep looking where I'm showing you. And in a few seconds, you're going to see some fire in the sky. And man, that was fire in the sky like I never saw. And I said, this guy's the devil. He ain't right. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the greatest pocket trick I never could do again. <laughs> right? <laughs> I, that's kind of the Daffy Duck moment. Okay, so I can only do this once. <laughs> <laughs> only one time. <laughs> I can only do this once. I know it's yeah, a great so trick. I'm dead now. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> is it true you made fire appear in the sky for Randall? <laughs> yeah. Well, just, uh, yeah, I saw it. That, that was hypnosis, time. wasn't it? Just that one time. <laughs> you well, must have. It was hypnosis. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, how do you, I guess, because it's, it's interesting to me that um, you began as a magician and moved into the world of the Tretur and, and, and the curator of Cajun knowledge and Cajun folklore. Uh, yeah. The, the website that you have, Cajun Mystic, is absolutely awesome. Um, it goes through stories like the Rougerou, uh, Rouge you know. The Lugaru, the Rougarou, yeah. yeah, the Cajun werewolf. Yeah. That's one of my, I love that one. And, and you see, the you go on the internet and you can find a, plethora of information about Lugaru, Rugaru, mm -hmm. but there is no one out there telling stories about him and performing as I like to, okay, the last show I did at the Hub and Pub, a, a nightclub restaurant last week, I tell the story about the Rugaru, the Lugaru, and how he comes out of the forest that night and when he approaches your house, especially where the front entrance is, just keep the Rugaru away from you in coming inside. You have to put 13 coins at the doorstep because the Lugaru cannot count past 12. So the Lugaru starts counting. When he gets to 12, he can't get to 13. So he starts all over again. Counts to 12, but he can't get to He starts all over again. And by that time, he's spending all his time at night trying to count past 12. And then all of a sudden, the sun is going to start coming up soon, so he retreats back into yeah. the forest. Well, just by itself, that's just a whole hum story. So what I do is, in my act, it's, it's a stunt. I like I hate calling them tricks. Uh, it's a stunt, uh, an effect that I do where I catch money out of the air, silver half dollars. So I say I like to say that the coins placed at the door should be produced magically. Let me get someone from the audience to come help me. Have, hold, hold the bucket, and then I'll start reaching into the air. And that gives, that yeah. gives facility for reason for catching coins out of the air. So I just sort of melded the two effects together. And then like when I cut and I do a rope, I cut and restore it, and I said, a, a, a street performer in New Orleans taught me how to do this. And then I goof, I can't restore it. And there's the big old knot. It's two pieces of rope tied together because I cut it into. Now, this guy, he was called Chicken Man, Prince Kiyama. You may have heard of him or maybe not. In New Orleans, he was a street uh, voodoo man, a shaman. And he says, Ken, I'm going to teach you how to do this. And he says, but if you goof, uh, I'll give you something that you can only use one time. And so I'm telling them, see, I goofed. And I reach into my bag. 
and pull out a voodoo doll, which has applied to the back of it a mechanism which produces a tremendous flash of fire by a flash cotton and an igniter. Sure. And so I'm waving it over the, they're holding, I'm holding the part where it's tied together and poof, and then I let go and the rope is restored. So you see, instead of just being a whole hum effect, <laughs> It, 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 I introduced the voodoo aspect to it and also to I make three knots appear in a row without tying them the usual way and then I go into the tradition of Cajuns how a knot of one the power has begun knot of two the power is true knot of three my will shall be now this is how the Cajun shamans us. they would say this in French le premier ne Le deuxième nœud et le troisième nœud, ça veut dire trois qualités des affaires d'aventure. And it's, it's my way of, instead of just telling the story, introducing the props. And of course, I'm using artistic license. I said, this is as well, far as a disclaimer that you're seeing. And I said, that, uh, oh, you, did I hear a little noise? You got to go? No, no. So I maybe was going to say, at the, same, at the same time, you're also introducing the, the Cajun language, the Cajun culture everything else to the story. Right. And the reason why I'm doing this now, as I tried to introduce this in some of my children's shows in the past uh, eight years, and the guy that books me, he called me, he said, uh, we've got some complaints. Don't do that voodoo doll thing. You know, it offends a lot of people. And then sometimes when I mentioned the Lugaru, the werewolf, and I said that, that too, don't, don't do that. Well, I said, well, that, that's, flies in the face of what I'm trying to do. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah I, that kind of takes <laughs> half my show away. Thanks, though. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then and, and then sometimes when I'll do a little uh, 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 Lisa de Bonaventure, which is a little fortune-telling segment, mm -hmm. which I do with the cards, it said if some of them have said, if you're gonna, it, that's satanic, if you're going to yeah. do any of that card reading, uh, we're not going to go to your show. So yeah. I'm looking at all that, and uh, i gotta make I got to make a living. So I have to drop all that. Yes. Yeah. So come October, so December the 8th is my last kid show. Uh, let me just put it down. I'm never going to see the word quit. Like my brother said when he was smoking, he says, I didn't quit. I stopped. <laughs> yeah. So what's this? It's the same thing. No, not quite. A quit means you really quit forever. Stop means let me think yeah. about it. So yeah, that's what that I'm going to that's, do. That's not going to be necessarily my main source of income anymore. <laughs> right. So I'm going to introduce like, this and say, well, nobody's going to buy that. Oh, I will. I love yeah. it. <laughs> like, you know, hey, the right kids charity comes along or something and needs a magician. Sure. You know, you'll come out of retirement and do a show for the kids. But Oh, you, for sure. You, yeah. Because you'll be doing kid... it every Saturday on the regs anymore. Right. That's right. Yeah, that, that's a, that's so true. And uh, <laughs> almost eighty years old, and I'm still love. But kids doing kids shows, it's very hard to just <laughs> abandon them because they really do love. They really do love the show because oh, yeah. I, I include them. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. well, I include uh, them. I don't. It's 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 one of those, uh, especially being able to pass on. Uh, the old stories, being able to curate that knowledge is so yes. incredible. Um, as we were talking about before the show, I mentioned it numerous times on my show, uh, the fact that, of course, the Cajun culture, um, as well as Creole, things like that, are are some of the only cultures native to America. Um, that are unique yes. are uniquely American. They exist nowhere else. Nowhere uh, else. They they are a the the language is unique. The culture is unique. The traditions are unique. Um, and to know that people your age, my grandparents' age, uh, who Cajun was their first language. Um, yes. And, and to know that it, at one point in time. Um, that was basically spanked out of you in school. You were put in a dunce hat and put in the corner uh, because that's all you spoke. You didn't want to speak English, things like that. Um, and to know that the the culture has slowly started to leave. Uh, many, many years ago, uh, one of my cousins 
in my family. Uh, Steve Lafleur started the band Mamou, and that yeah. was really my first, um, I guess, awakening. And I was probably about seventh grade, where it was like, "Wow, here is a part of Cajun culture that I can grasp onto." And he was really yes. the first person to meld traditional songs like Jean Le Blanc stuff like that with rock and yes. roll music. Um, and it was such an amazing meld. Um, it birthed a whole genre of music. It's it's absolutely amazing. I I know of a good two or three bands just from up around this area that do almost the same thing. Um, and it's great, and it really does expose people to a different part of the culture. Um, it sure does. Yes. Uh, how do you how do you feel about uh, where? where the culture is now within modern society, I guess, you know, uh, yeah, that's what, a, do you, what do that's you see a, gained? What do you see lost as someone uh, who was in that teetering moment and, and has seen that, that I guess crest and trough of the wave. Impressed that, when I was doing a show at where I just told you, Hub and Pub, a girl approached me and she's doing preservation of the Cajun situation, uh, culture. And she mentioned the Rougarou that she had obtained from a website and she named it. And I said, that's mine. <laughs> the Cajun hey, yeah, that's and a, she uh, said, that's oh, that's you. Nice she website. says, look, give me, give, give me your phone number. We need to contact you. I'm thinking, yeah. you know, I, I have macular degeneration and I don't drive anymore and my wife drives me to the kids shows and it's getting harder and harder. So I, the main, first thing I say is, uh, I, I don't think I can unless you can come get me and bring me and put me back. Like I did the Cajun word of the week at, uh, Acadiana open challenge one, you know, yeah. The, the, and uh, we did like 15, 15 second segments for a year's worth of them where I, and yeah. Cajun, Mo, Mo de Jo, Mo is word in French, but it's also yeah. how my name is pronounced, Mo. Yeah. So I'm, um, right, so I do a Cajun word and I do a little skit where it's used and then we do the English of what it means. It's all edgy. And then we do the reverse of it. We do the the French version and translate it to the English. And that has, I don't catch AOC, but that has been showing for a long time. And now it was against a green screen. And I was impressed with the backgrounding that they use the swamps and roosters and stuff like that. Wow. That's terrific. And yeah. uh, that's one way of preserve, preserving it. You know, it's uh, of course it's on AOC that no one ever watches. <laughs> yeah. Hardly anyway. But uh, it, every once in a while, someone comes up with a terrific idea and then it just falls flat. In fact, Animal Planet had contacted me and they said, we're holding auditions in New Orleans on off of Penniston Street, I think it was, at a Creole, a Creole lady's house. It was an ex, a, a former actress. And we need someone to be, a, this was not hoodoo, this was voodoo. Voodoo. Yeah, uh, in New Orleans. And we need someone to be like a voodoo person who's knowledgeable and does this and we're going to shoot around it and do it. And I really didn't catch everything, what their plans were, but we, there were about most of the people auditioning sent in their stuff via the electronic stuff, which I can't do because I am not computer savvy. So I had to appear there in person. And there was about 150 of us who had to do the same in person. And there was some there, which I would have selected, because they were of that Ethiopian quality, which really fit what you would expect someone doing that in New Orleans. But since they called me, okay, I put a tape recorder with some voodoo music playing, and I, Boudini always was like a Caucasian swamp hoodoo man. Top okay. hat, the beast, typical witch doctor look. And I'm dressed like that, and I'm doing my voodoo doll thing in my hand, which rises, and I'm flatter. J'apprais en parler en français, comment ça grille là, comment ça grille là, pour And lo and behold, out of all those people, over 200 people, I was selected by Animal Planet. But the per diem 
when they called me, it was $100 a day. And my wife and I started talking. You know, you can't live in New Orleans Mm-mm. for three months at a time for $100 a day. No. So we began, Aaron Wilder, I can name his name now. He was the director and he doesn't work for Animal Planet anymore. So sorry, Aaron. But he, uh, later on, when I was asking him if they could increase the per, per diem because I have to uproot here and I got to go live in New Orleans. And he said, oh, the project was scrubbed. They went with, uh, yeah. I think, swamp people or something. Mm-hmm. With a similar thing, he said, uh, "Sorry, <laughs> yeah. but that was interesting." And and I think, other than someone choosing one of more in that line of character, was that a lot of them couldn't act, and that might sure. have been what sold me because here I was already all these years. I've been in movies with uh, Belazar the Cajun, mm. John and Poole, and. Uh, where I, they called me, you know, because of the French and uh, Casey Shadow, Walter Matthau. Yeah. And uh, I, there was, uh, I was on, there was a set where they were, they should have used someone to clarify what the um, electric mist, I think, or something like that with, um, ah, I'd have to ask my wife what the guy's name was. But, I was watching the watching the outtakes, and he would talk to someone, and he was using the word "shon," where "come over yeah. here, shon." And yeah. I'm thinking, That's you guys you got it wrong. It's not "shon," it's "sha." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's "sha," not "shon." <laughs> yeah, and it's spelled C H E R. Yeah, share like share, <laughs> right? But we Cajuns don't say "share." They say no. "sha." Sha. Yeah. And I could never teach the guy. He said, say it again. Sha. Sha. No. <laughs> it's, yeah. it, apparently, it's not that easy to speak Cajun French. Like yeah. the, one, of the, one of the directors at Channel 15 where I worked, there was a salesman that walked by him and he had a, a toupee. And Kenny says, Kenny wanted to speak French so bad. And he says, he points to the salesman and he says, Sassani pas de real hair, no. And everybody popped out laughing. You just told everybody what you said. No, I said it in French. Ask Kenneth. He can tell you. He speaks French better than us. I said, Kenny, come over here. You said, Sassani pas. That's French. But you went to the real hair. <laughs> yes. Well, how would you say it, Ken? Sassani pas le cheveu même. What? Well, and, and, and that was really a lot of my exposure as a child in Channel View, Texas. Uh, spending weekends and weeks with my grandmother and grandfather, who were both from Mamu, uh, very deep, uh, as we would say, right underneath the raccoon's tail, uh, Louisiana. Uh, And just hearing, knowing when they didn't want me to hear something. (laughs) It's... Be fresh, <laughs> yeah. And yeah. without realizing it, you're thing. learning it. But but here and there, they would also just like uh, like you were saying, it was it, the conversation would flow between French and English as they spoke. Yeah, to each other. between French, I, I called it Kajinglish. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it was such a it's such a beautiful tongue. It's such a beautiful language. And the two, the two things that I wish I'd really, really focused on in my time uh, in Mamu was, number one, learning Cajun, um, at least yeah. to the best of my ability, uh, yeah. and also learning to play the Cajun accordion. Yeah. Uh, I'm still learning uh, a, a lot of... Uh, well, I'm... Okay, here's what a Cajun would say. Trap more canned de tomate. Catch me a can of tomatoes. Well, you just said can. That's English. So I went on the internet. How do you say can? And it's what conserve. Well, golly, I never, we never used that word. <laughs> yeah. So apparently in the 17th century, there were no cans. Yeah, no. So they didn't yeah. learn to use. So now when they moved into the 20th century, they just adopted whatever it was called in English. Sort of like in France where it progressed, a car became a voiture. But a Cajun will say, un char, which is a wagon or a chariot. Yeah. Or, or 
our truck, as Cajun will say, uh, it's a truck. I bought me a truck, but it's, he should be saying, it's a camion. In, in France, a truck is a camion, not a truck. But it's not that it's wrong French, it's that we're still speaking. The, it, Cajuns never went to school to learn Cajun French how to read and write it. Yeah. That, so that's why they had, they were trapped into that language process. You know, let me, let me just give a, a list of the shows that I tried and didn't work. Dinner and a Ghost, Animal Planet, <laughs> Voodoo and Voodoo, Mysterious Louisiana, Cajun Psychic Learning Channel. That was the learning channel that actually came down in okay. Sunset to try that one. Haunting Mistress from Bayou to New Orleans. Uh, the, the purpose of all these shows was to entertain, enlighten, spellbound, and enchant. Because there were these subjects. I'm going to rattle these subjects off now. I think I've wrote them down, so it's not going to be memory. Traitor, that's the first one. Hoodoo, not voodoo. Fifole, you know what that one is. That's mm. the swamp lights, the mysterious swamp slides, where, yeah. where it was legend that these were people who buried John Lafitte's treasure, and he had them killed, and... Uh, yeah. cursed their ghost to guard and then the Kushma which is uh, sleep paralysis by scientific definition but it's yeah. where the word nightmare comes from where yeah. the she rides you back it's the, now it's the old ma- old hag syndrome the old yeah. hag syndrome and right. I suffer and from that uh, I had it's, that. it's I had, absolutely horrifying <laughs> I know I had I had that once too I heard the door close, the swish of a dress, and on my back she was, and I heard her breathe in my ear, and you cannot move. Yeah, yeah. You're paralyzed. And with a great effort, you can burst free, and then there's nothing there. Yep, yeah. That is uh, really weird. I, I, And I've had it where um, I can hear the people around me, um, but I'm still in dream. Like, that's what I'm seeing. It's, uh, yeah. Uh, it's amazing and I, horrifying at the same time. It is, and I, 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 can't I do not explain it. No, and I don't think it's lucid dreaming, is because it no. seems like I'm awake while it's happening. And like the people around you should be saying, hey, get that witch off his back. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's just it. Like, I've, I've definitely uh, not just done lucid dreaming for years, uh, for at least a good four or five years of my life. Uh, I practiced active dreaming um, where I would go to sleep with intent um, yeah. to to actively look for something in my dreams. Um, or, or astral projection, as it might be. Or, uh, steps before that, I'm yeah. nowhere near that. Uh, I've since even lost the ability to even meditate, uh, oh my. which is okay. horrifying to me. Um, yeah. to, to not be able to find still and quiet, um, especially with the maelstrom of the world that goes on around us. Uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's really wild for me. Um, it, because mental pollution around us might be yeah. hampering your ability to tap into what some, a high, uh, cosmic streaming consciousness. Yeah. Cause I mean, I, I used to remember my dreams vividly. I used to actively take part in them. Like I said, I would go to sleep specifically looking for answers to things. Um, and it was great. It was, it was an amazing, amazing, uh, realm of being. Yes. Yes. And that's, that's, yeah. It's a, wow. I, the, uh, you know, I don't, the, uh, I, don't, I, don't I don't really, uh, there's the power of the three tour, ladies and gentlemen. Um, without even being present or laying hands, uh, he just got that out of me. Um, and that's something that maybe my wife knows and maybe a couple other people in the world, Ken. Uh, that is, that is something that is a very guarded secret for me. Uh, the fact that that it is something that I did um, and something that I am lacking in spiritually. Uh, so kudos to you for, uh, well, <laughs> for dropping my wall. <laughs> well, <laughs> and there are so many other subjects to cover because there's the, uh, Lisa de Bonaventure, that's card readers 
fortune mm-hmm. tellers in this area who are known. Madame Grandois, that's uh, like a boogeyman. That one's rare. Hardly anyone knows about that one anymore. The Lugaru, which we talked about. There's even a Rugaru festival somewhere in... Um, I don't, know, I don't remember where now. I I saw it. On, I I posted it to my Facebook. I'm trying to remember where that. it is too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because <laughs> as I was researching things for this episode, and of course getting getting that story straight, now uh, explain to people what that is, because that's that of among swamp lore, amongst these Cajun tales, and I remember um, I'll have to find it somewhere. I have the tape copy that my grandfather used to listen to that was Cajun Tales. And it was, I, I listened to it for years. Um, I don't understand Cajun French. <laughs> but for me, it was just so entirely soothing to listen to yeah. the stories being told on tape um, in a language that was so familiar to me that I didn't understand. Um, it was like a warm hug for me to listen to them. Uh, so I need to find those and digitize them and send them to you because uh, that would be really cool to translate those into yes, English. Yes, that's for sure. Um, yes. I think and, it's Terborn Parish where a lot of this, just, my memory just popped, up, popped the information. Not okay. so much strong here in Vermilion Parish, but uh, it's like an all-white creature. It's probably shared, probably brought, with the Cajuns to Canada, from France to Canada, from Eastern Europe. Uh, and it's a shapeshifter, which is very prominently popular among Native American Indians. And a lot of, they say that if you kill, here's one of the legends, if you kill a Lugaru or Rugaru, you must not tell anyone about it for a year or you will turn into a Rugaru. Those are just the le- There's so many legends connected with it. I, uh, some say it's probably a sighting of Bigfoot, maybe locally. Well, and I was going to ma- say a lot. A lot of the descriptions, a lot of the, a lot of the stories ring very much of Wendigo. Um, Wendigo, right? The, the, the Indian uh, from, from believe it or not, folks, Canada. Um, <laughs> yeah. Hello. 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 <laughs> yeah. Imagine that. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, from right up around that region where they kicked us out. Uh, and like I said before the show, I I used to challenge people when I lived in Maine all the time. What does it take to get kicked out of Canada? Like just <laughs> yeah. just just to want to stay Catholic and not want a king. That that's pretty yeah. much it. <laughs> Yeah, we don't want to pledge allegiance to the king. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's so many, so many fascinating stories. You know, uh, but yeah, um, to know that these stories go way back that far. Um, what are what are some of the other great uh, swamp lore stories? Some of the some of the other ones that you have there on CajunMystic dot com. The, well, the Rugaru, and then uh, there's also, like I said, the Lisa, the Bonavater, the Readers, and uh, uh, the Fifole is one strong one in this area, is even down here. And there's even a road in Lafayette called Fifole Road. Okay. And uh, I did a lecture once on the Fifole at AOC, where on because of the Fifole Road, and I. I Threw it out. Of the, I blasted is, the theory. What's the story? It's a ghost light. Okay, there are other regions in America which have the same thing called the Ozark Mountain Lights, okay. which are spook lights. There's the Will of the Wisp, which are predominantly all over sure. the world. And this stupid idea that it's called swamp gas. Yeah. Things like the Martha Lights. Stuff like that. The Marfa Lights for Texas. Mysteries for years. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. The Marfa yeah. Lights. Gold and, Breeze. Um, yeah. Yeah. To this day, no one knows what they are. Of course, they're attributed to some sort of probably plasma or natural phenomena, but still in all, they're still the ghost lights, the spook lights, the fascination. And the Cajuns used to say, you open a pocket knife and put it on the fence post, 
And when the fee filet would come, it would sweep it would sweep itself back and forth over the pocket knife, and you'd go the next day and you'd find blood. Okay, another one was that they were the spirits of unbaptized okay. children. Oh, uh, oh, oh, okay, hold on just a second because um, that, I just I just got to back that up. So you you put the pocket knife on your on your fence post. Uh, yeah, you know you uh, you open it, you know, like yeah, yeah, a, yeah, not, with blade out, you know, blade facing right. out where it's like a barrier. And right, and, and if a fifole comes by, you'll find blood in the morning. When your fifole comes, and instead of attacking you or whatever, or sure, scaring sure. you by coming any closer, it will get attracted to the knife and it'll swipe itself back and forth over the knife. And then leave, ah, and, then the ne- and then the next day, it gives me chills. <laughs> like just, just imagining or seeing that right now, just completely yeah. gives me chills. Oh my god! And that I, was I'm one that... somebody that gets creeped out easily. Uh, I did a lot of paranormal, like I've done paranormal investigation work. I've been out on ghost hunts. Like uh, I don't creep easily, Ken. Uh, that is creepy to me. <laughs> now some have yeah because of the blood some have even been radical enough to say it's probably a bird with luminous feathers or something. <laughs> wow! <laughs> I mean, so, so much is it. They, why, why would it bleed? How? What, what? What? It's just a light. What's? What's? What's it bleeding for? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> like I've, I've got I've got goose pimples all over me, man. Uh, isn't it something? Yeah, <laughs> right. Oh. And I've I've spoken to many people who have seen them. You know, I wish I could see them see them myself. <laughs> I love all this stuff. You know, I've I've definitely seen some things in my life. Um, I've definitely felt more things than seen them. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, I'm I, listening. I, the my my experience going into the seminary was. Uh, ex- the only way I can say it is beatific. Um, I, I felt the actual true presence of my God. Okay, got it. I, 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 um, I cannot... I, it was there. It was ever present. And I know that feeling anytime I feel it. Like, I've I've learned to recognize that little pull in my stomach as that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And I... I I trust that implicitly beyond all logic, beyond all reason. When that happens, I listen. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, and yes. That, that was just my experience. Um, it led me down a religious road to begin with uh, that branched into a multiple spiritual realm of possibilities and learning and just this lust that's the only way I can put it um, is a lust for the knowledge of the theological, the philosophical, um, just this quest for knowledge uh, and to ingest as much as possible. And when it yes. came to my my culture, um, when I was exposed to it, um, I I wanted to learn as much as I possibly could. Yes. Yes. You know, well, we'll have to touch on the ghost stories next time because we haven't even touched on the Myrtle Plantation. Well, keep, by the ghost keep going. Boy. We, 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 we <laughs> do assume the fact we're done, Ken. Um, <laughs> feel free. Go go ahead with the Myrtle Plantation because that is that is a big one um, that's in a, Louisiana. That's a big one. And, and I'm glad it's that has been covered many times on some of the ghost mm-hmm. hunting shows. And that was good to hear. Also, the uh, La Laura House in New Orleans, you know, the uh, yeah. home to the spirit, the evil mistress who poisoned her slaves in 1834. And uh, there's one, those are the well known ones, but I'm looking at one that was here locally that is not far from here. And I have to be very careful because the relatives are. St- still around okay. and they will discount any of the rumors towards well, the old don't home use, stuff. Don't use any names or anything like no that. Names, tell, no names. Feel free to but tell I had story. Been, uh, I, had been in, I had been inquiring. I had been hearing these stories since I was in high school and I knew the name of this place but I never knew it was supposed to be a, a mansion, you know, like a plantation 
a plantation type mansion. And about 1973, I was also a photographer at one time, a newspaper photographer, and I was doing work for Mr. Koch, who was running for sheriff, and he couldn't speak. Or did they sit in American, meaning he didn't speak French. He was an American. So he needed his stepfather, his, uh, yeah, his uh, stepfather, who, who didn't speak much English, as an interpreter. And he needed me there as the photographer to take publicity pictures for his campaign. And he was canvassing the area, going to different places. And so we pulled up into this, like I call it, the swamps. Not really stereotypical swamps, but the backwoods. Sure. And it's a nice brick house we're looking at. We pull up, and he, Mr. Koch gets down, and while we're talking, you know, and his father-in-law is in the car. He names the people, and, oh, that's the, I remember the name. Uh, C'est pas ça la maison que, que deserve, no? I'm, I said, isn't that the house that's supposed to be haunted with ghosts? And he said, yeah. And he said, wait, no, that's not the house. That's the new house. Wait, wait. We had been parked at an angle, and he turns and he said, la, meaning there. And I turned, and I had never seen that thing while we pulled up. It was gray, with the background gray and the swampy dead trees. It was almost like something Hollywood would have made a horror movie with a dead gray house. Wow. Surrounded by dead gray trees, the most creepiest looking house. <laughs> oh, this is so, yeah. <laughs> But the story of, of it was that the grandparents that owned the property, it bought it. And I'm, I'm, the fellow that sent me this information, he said, you had been inquiring. And all the relatives said, no, that's, that's bull. The, the house is not haunted. Not true. And he, he contacted me and he said, the house is indeed haunted. And that's, this is, I'm reading sort of from wow. what he said, Mr. Blank was a huge rice and cane cattle farmer. He had quite a lot of money and was very old school. One thing is he never believed or trusted banks. They kept large sums of money hidden in the walls, on the floorboards, and in the attics. Anyway, as he says, as a child, he heard that the old blank home was haunted. And according to the story that I heard, this is Mr. Blank talking, was that when Mr. and his wife were living in the old house, which was near, of course, he would hide his profits from farming in odd places. Well, he fell sick and was at the hospital for a few nights. And upon his return, he discovered that a large amount of money was hidden and missing. He confronted his siblings supposedly, and they all denied taking any of the money. Mr. Blank paid most of his bills with cash. Anyway, as time passed, Mr. Blank built a new home, the one I saw, brick home, which was near the, oh, I almost named where it was, but I'd like to hear, but I won't. Yeah. Okay. Don't, don't, the do, new, that. don't do that. No. The new we home is where- We can talk about where, it all day off air. <laughs> yeah. Okay, he says the new home is where they lived until their death. They would use the old home said for family gatherings and such. Well, supposedly after the death of Mr. Blank, Mr. Blank Blank inherited the old original home of Mr. Blank. So Blank gathered his wife and children and they moved into the home. And rumor has it, that they were unable to sleep even for one night in the house as strange noises were heard. Chairs would rock and move by themselves, boots walking across the floor, doors open and closed on their own. The blank family, so they left the house in the middle of the night in fear. A few months later, as uh, more... Uh, no, not normal, but <laughs> more uh, people were telling them, you imagine that a few months passed and feel a, feeling that they, oh, felt stupid. They felt stupid. They again attempted to move into the old home again. 
they had to leave in the middle of the night again. And that is when Blank decided to build a new home on the same property several hundred yards away from the old home of Mr. Blank. Being Mr. Blank and his family were unable to stay in the old homestead, rumor has it that it was Blank who had taken the money from Mr. his father. Now, as I said, this is him speaking, this was all hearsay from one family. I can't say that he was the one that really stole it. But to answer your question, if the home, home was haunted, rumor has it, it was not rumor, yes. But it was only haunted for the one family. Other people who stayed in the house were good and had no sightings. Now, here's the strange piece de, piece de resistance to the story. <laughs> that new, brand new brick home that Mr. Koch had gone into, yeah. then that night, that night, that house burned to the ground. Not the spooky house, the new house burned to the ground. And the newspaper account I was reading, the hot, the fire was so hot that steel melted. Now, I found out later that is not impossible. It's no. happened before. It's not it's not common, but it's not supernatural. Some fires have been so hot that steel sure. has melted. But, oh, wow. The night after, after the, the day after I saw that house, the next night it burns to the ground. <laughs> Crazy. Uh, yeah, that is some. Um, but I, I, it's it's like you were saying how it affected you, the, the story with the FIFA lady and the knife. When I turned and I saw that house, I felt that feeling in the pit of my stomach, something, I don't want to use the word evil because I just don't know what evil, you different. know, it, it, but it, yeah, different it was wrong. different, different and, wrong. and, <laughs> and I will tell you it was daytime and I was scared. <laughs> yeah. I would yeah. not have gone in that house. Yeah. I've, uh, I, I've definitely, like I said earlier, having, having felt, that presence um in in having the the night terrors i guess would be what it's what it's known as popularly um in in modern culture um but it's definitely yes, something that i'm i'm much more attuned to uh like i don't even yes. have a tv in my bedroom and that okay. was something that i've i've had my whole life but uh okay. I don't I don't like sleeping with them nearby. I don't I don't like sleeping. I guess I've I've adopted this old school concept of uh I don't want a mirror in my bedroom. Um Yes. I don't I <laughs> I don't uh I, I They used to I, cover I, mirrors when someone would yeah. die so that the spirit yeah. <clears throat> yes, that was a tradition absolutely. here too. Absolutely. Um and even even uh, morning mirrors, things like that. Um, and for me, it's the concept of uh, a dark mirror is used for scrying. It's used specifically yes. for reaching yes. into the next realm. Um, You're right, right, yes. And I, I, I don't want that in my room. And if you start looking no. kind of at, uh, like, for instance, the movie Constantine, where where all of the demons are very self involved, um, and you can yes. use a mirror to draw them out from people uh, because yes. they're so lustful and and self involved with things. Uh, I think it's such a statement as to where yes. we have come spiritually as a society, where we're we're hypnotized by this black mirror that we all carry with us. Yes, forever I and always, that. and that, yeah, there's even a show called Black Mirror, and it's, yes. I, I don't even doubt the fact that that is what they're talking about. The fact I, that I, like, I might... what we are putting out, we're manifesting, and all this thing. Like I've got a, I've got a three foot one sitting in front of me right now in my hotel room. Uh, yeah, for what? <laughs> a three foot Black Mirror. Oh, okay. Three and a half okay. foot. You know, like wow. TV that's mounted on my wall in the hotel room. Um, and yeah, I'm not going to lie. I typically cover them. Um, I don't, I don't want them. 
I don't want them where I sleep. Uh, I don't watch TV where I sleep anymore. Uh, sleep is a sacred thing. It's meant to be done in silence. It's meant to be done yes. in a meditative state, I believe. That's right. I agree uh, with that. I agree totally with that. If, but I, I do, I, I, when I used to, I used to do psychic readings, and uh, I, I even worked on a 900 psychic line back in the old oh, wow. days, and I, do, I did private readings. And I, Wasn't Cleo, I trained, was it? Was it what? what no, it, what, no, what no, no, no. This Cleo? was uh, this was yeah, uh, David David now. Lowell and Associates. Yeah, David. <laughs> Lowell, this is David Lowell and Associates. It was a uh, uh, Dion Warwick had a program. Yeah, yeah. yeah I worked worked with her outfit. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, well, uh, uh, hey, I had to pay twenty one dollars an hour. <laughs> hey, <you're okay. laughs> anyway, and I did private readings. I do rune stones and I do card readings. Okay. Or I did, and I trained the fellow to do. He's he's doing it this now. And he called me one day. He said, "Now, now, this, now I'm not going to try to even explain it because uh, he said a vampire brought a mirror. Now there are vampires, you know. <laughs> oh sure, yeah, and he, it's a vampire that he even went to school with. Him and his sister both vampires, and he said they brought me this mirror and it's covered and it's a black mirror and there's. Like you said, there's things in it. And he says, I'm scared to peek it. He says, use your shaman, your thing you do. Take a look at it and tell me what you feel. And I said, Ron, I let me give you a quote. That thing. <laughs> let me give you a quote. <laughs> I, you I, said, Ron, I said, Ron, let me give you a quote from Mark Twain. Mark Twain once said, I don't believe in ghosts, but I'm scared of them anyway. <laughs> That's it. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Maybe I don't believe it, but I'm not going to take a chance. Yeah. (laughs) What if that thing follows me home? (laughs) Yeah, like 90% of people wouldn't believe in what I do. Yeah, that's right. (laughs) Uh, Most people think that what I do and what what David does for a living, like we feed magic elves in a box to make those things Mm -hmm. pop up on screen. You know, they have no idea what the hell we're doing or what buttons we're pushing. It's no less a form of magic or prestidigitation than what than what you do on the daily um, as right. a magician. Now, I, right. I guess one of my questions um, spiritually uh, would be someone who here in the area or uh, even in the Ozarks, something like that, uh, how would they go about exploring the option of Threiter? Um, how would they know that um, that might be a calling to them? How how would they go about uh, going down that path? Were that something that they would consider? I think you have that calling now, as I'm picking oh, well, up from you. Well, sure. I mean, it's it's yeah. something I would be interested in. But how how would the general would... person? Uh, Find out more about this. How would they be able to uh, research that in their local area? Golly, I don't know because they all, they were making a movie here. Uh, I forget the movie now. Maybe it was Casey Shadow. Uh, Duvall, what's his name? Richard Duvall. Robert Duvall. Robert Duvall, he was down here, and he was in the islands, Forked Island, Hmm. and he was in a small little grocery store. I'm talking about 40 years ago. And he happened to hear, there was a woman who was a traitor, and she was on the phone treating someone by phone. And if you'd hear it, it sounds like some sort of medieval chant, if you were to hear it. And you're not supposed to hear it, except the person you're treating. But he was standing off to the side and he could hear this woman, the traitor, doing her thing. And when she hung up, he said, I'd like to know, and he had did a little research, was that what you call that, he couldn't pronounce the word, he called it treater yeah. thing that people would do here. <laughs> yeah, it almost she looked looks, at him, if you look at the word, it almost sounds like traitor. Traitor, yeah. <laughs> but know? she looked at him and she said, flat told him, this is none of your business. 
I mean, she didn't know who Robert Duvall was. Sure, sure. She said, this is none of your business. This is secret, and this uh, I, you weren't even supposed to hear me. So if someone wanted to learn, <laughs> I wonder if they would have said, this is none of your business. I think the three there has to choose you. Yeah, In fact, my wife, my wife the, is standing the right here. I'm going to ask her. Now, do you think that to learn Trita, that they would teach you if you would ask them, or does it, does it have to be passed on by choice by the Trita? I want to give it to my grandchild. If you would ask, they would teach you. If the sex was right and the age, right. Yeah, there are funny rules. My daughter wants me to teach it, but she doesn't want to learn it in French. And kind of like the hundredth monkey syndrome, mine has been developed with the French. I yeah. said, you probably will learn it in English, but you have to do it repetitively so that it sort of like creates a memory of its own inherently. Yeah. And then it becomes your modality. Yeah, where it, your where, it becomes your, where it becomes your daily mantra that you say two, three times a day. Or once an oh, that, hour on oh, the hour, something. Oh, like that's that. well put. Oh, Chris, that's well put. That's exactly right. So, because she thought maybe because she couldn't speak French, she yeah. wouldn't be able to do and, it. And that yeah. was an interesting point that uh, my cousin Stevie did with Mamou was he didn't grow up speaking French. Um, when it came to translating songs like Jolie Blanc. Uh, he had his mother teach him how to sing the song. Yeah. He had his mom teach it. Like, he was like, I, I, like, I can't translate it for you, but I know how to sing the song in French. Yes. God, <laughs> yeah. You know, like, I, I had somebody yeah. teach me, like, how to say the words in French so that I could at least sing it in French. Um, and he said yes. learn things and stuff like that, but... It was a very interesting uh, way to bring that about and to keep it pure and to keep it honest. Um, yes. Where, where it, at the very least, you could be paying respect to the words as they're written um, and the beauty in which they're written. That's true. That is so true. Golly, that's right. <laughs> Darn. Oh, this is great. This has been great. I tell you, I'm, I'm enjoying this and... Uh, I hope, I really hope and pray that it benefits the culture, people listening out there all over the world, and we'll yeah. do further inquiry into this because uh, we've just scratched the surface. There's a whole lot more. Well, and, and, and that's just it. You know, like I said, um, unfortunately, and nothing against the beautiful culture of New Orleans, there is a world unto itself. Um, but as I walked out of the airport uh, the other day into New Orleans, um, I don't often fly into New Orleans, I'm typically driving in. Um, and they're on a, they're on one of the huge co columns supporting the parking garage was this Mardi Gras, you know, green, gold, and purple column that said, expose yourself to the Mardi Gras. And I'm like, wow, there you go. <laughs> That, yeah. That's there how you, you keep it culturally real, right there. Yes, <laughs> right there. <laughs> In this hashtag Me Too world and movement, um, expose yeah. yourself to the Mardi Gras. Like you know yeah. what you know what double entendre you're pulling off. Um, yeah. You know, and it was it's just one of those uh, like I tell people all the time. Yes, Mardi Gras in New Orleans is something to experience in life. Go experience it, whatever. Um, if you want a real Mardi Gras, uh, get yourself out to somewhere like Mamou. Get yourself out somewhere into the country um, where where you're oh, going to see I something traditional, where you're going to see. Uh, the outfits of the Mardi Gras are much more in tune with oh. the 17th century. Um, yeah, you know, like we that, that was, earlier. It, it was it was about oh shoot, about 1957. I drove out into that area, Mamour, and don't remember where because back then I was drinking a bit, and, and uh, <laughs> me and <laughs> no. me. Me, me and my friend, <laughs> we ended up 
it was a, it's almost like a born, a big Mardi Gras festival going on. And the lighting, incandescent lighting, you know, and it was not like the day's pure bright lights. And the costumes some made with peat moss, I mean, oh, yeah. peat moss, uh, oh, yeah. and straw. And there was a, a Halloweenish quality, the Ira Lejeune type music that was piercing into the night air and they would like parading around the room and it gave me the chills. It felt as yeah. though I had stepped back into Europe somewhat time around the, the dark ages. It was just, yeah. and that piercing and not an English word. Oh, I got goosebumps just remembering it's it. A, it. And, uh, it's so entirely beautiful. I actually have a couple videos, um, online on my YouTube channel. Uh, for HC Productions, my production company, where I went out and actually filmed Mamu Mardi Gras. Um, people yeah. going out and dancing for chickens and doing backflips off of horses and dancing on top of horses. And, you know, just what a traditional Mardi Gras is. Uh, and it's it's so entirely beautiful. It's great. Um, yes, it sure it's, is. It's a coming together of a community um, at a time where... Uh, some have much, many have none. Yeah. Um, and it's 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 a point where everybody's equal. Uh behind yeah. those behind those masks, everybody is equal. Um That's right. That's so true. It's it's a really utterly beautiful concept as you as you move <laughs> yeah. into that time of year that once again, we go right back into religion and the the root of Catholicism within the Cajun culture yep. and things like that. That's uh, right. With the with the Mardi Gras itself um, being yeah. being the fact of you know, Fat Tuesday, we're eating all of the fatted meat, everything that we're not going to yeah. be able to eat for forty days is no good to let it go to waste. Yeah, so that's right. We can at least make a that's sauce right. for everybody. And, uh, you know, have some drinks because we ain't going to be able to do that for 40 days either. Um, That's right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in Hollow Beach, there's a, uh, there's a building, a bar, a bar where uh, it was a, it's a bar. This was, and now we're talking about 50 and more years ago. And on, it's a tourist area. I'm sure you heard of Hollow Beach. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, People there go for the beach experience, and there's some people that live there. But on Sundays, a priest holds mass in the bar, for, you know, nice. because there's no church there. And so, someone curious bystander, what's that? And my kind of priest. Yeah. Well, <laughs> someone has asked a Cajun, you went in the bar and got drunk that night and the next morning you go in that same bar and there's a priest holding mass. Do you think that's, you think that's right? And then the Cajun said, what's wrong with holding mass? Yeah. <laughs> in other words, you didn't say, what's wrong with going to church? Yeah. Doesn't matter. You didn't say, yeah. Who said so, any of us yeah. ever left the place? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that was, that was funny. Any of us, we could have been yeah. here all night. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but see, that's how that's how it melded together. The three, uh, in, in fact, recently, two deceased of our family who were cremated, and we all celebrated, holding, toasting, and cans of beer as they had wanted <laughs> before the ashes was spread. So we sort of like returning to some, I don't know. It, it's all very interesting and Was creative. Was it and, Coors Light? Yeah. <laughs> the, silver silver the bullet. National up, drink, it, the national drink yeah. of Louisiana? <laughs> yeah. The 10 ounce Coors Light? Yeah, yeah that's it. <laughs> the, the Rouge a Roux killer? <laughs> yeah, the, the silver, silver bullet. Silver bullet? <laughs> yeah. Oh, got it. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, as we kind of close things out, like we we've we've had some fun, we've had some amazing light uh, in in telling these stories and sharing these stories, and I definitely want to have you on regularly, uh, Ken, okay. to, to to talk about these stories, to to share some of them, to to kind of chronicle them. 
uh, so sure. to speak. Um, and, and just and have people call in, maybe and ask questions. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, they absolutely. may be curious. Yeah, absolutely. Um, where, where can people go, uh, to find out more about this? Tell us a little bit about your website. Um, tell us a little bit about, uh, where they can go to find out more information, not only about, uh, Cajun folklore, but also the history of Three tours, things like that. Google. Luckily, we live in an age. Google it, and it's out there. True. And what's missing, like I say, I mean, because a lot of people have really put some very informative information out there. I don't know. I, I check, you know, for comments at the end of them, and I see no one's bringing comments. So apparently, people are not really going to them, but. If you want to learn something, it's out there. But I think what's really missing is the artistic expression of yeah. uh, presentation, like what we're doing now. People would, instead of looking up some of this information, they'd rather see a guy get up and talk about the Lugado and the 13 coins, and all of a sudden he's catching coins out of the air. And it's sort of infotainment, in a sense, at the same time. Exactly. Information, information and entertainment together. Yeah, I, I that, that's my theory anyway. Yeah, hey, Ed, because the the website I have is still an ongoing project and it's still a workable yeah. title, but I'm not sure what it's going to be. And uh, I th- I think I'm going to work on it some more. With and we'll can I uh, probably be able if I can get whoever made it for me put this program onto it. Oh yeah, and uh, I haven't really. I've tried booking it into different places and. No one, no one's buying it. In fact, when I went, when I had presented this, uh, Mr. LeBlanc had tried to present this to the Tourist Commission about ten years ago. He said, "Hands went up in my face," and they said, "Hell no! This, yeah. as far as we're concerned, yeah, this no. does not exist in Louisiana. It never existed, and we don't want nothing to do with that. We don't want to scare people off with werewolves and voodoo and a- oh man." That's the answer I get, <laughs> but I won't give up. I'm still here, and one of these days it's going to sell. Yeah. Well, I I can't thank you enough for coming on tonight, uh, for talking about this, for uh, sharing the culture, sharing the tradition, sharing the history uh, behind these stories, behind the yeah. the, sha- the shadow side of Cajun culture. Yeah, yeah, the the the, mm-hmm. the unspoken side. The unspoken side, yeah. Yeah. So. Mon croix d'espoir, c'est les Américains qui l'ont découragé les Cajuns de ça. What I just said was sometimes I think it's foreigners, the Americans, the educated part that came out here and said, put that all aside and let's let's progress into the 21st century and leave all that stuff behind. <laughs> yeah. And then they got some yolk like me that's trying to keep it alive. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, If you would like to learn more about these stories, if you would like to learn more about Cajun culture, Cajun history, uh, and folklore, you can gladly go to CajunMystic.com. Check out more of the work of Kim Mo there. Uh, You can check out some of the great work of Boudini. Um, Ken, please do hold the line. I'd love to chat with you off air. Uh, once again, everybody, while you're online checking all of that out, please do go on and check out HC Universal Network. That is our parent network. You can also find things like the Yes But Why podcast, Talking Sound, uh, you know, um, Gray Matters with Mike Devine, uh, all kinds of fantastic stuff. Uh, until next time, everybody, remember, if you can't be good, be good at it. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Dudes and Beer Podcast. To listen to our audio streams or chat with us live, download the official Dudes and Beer app for Android and iDevices, available on Google Play and iTunes markets. For more episodes, content, and information, visit us online at dudesandbeer.com. You can also find our episodes on Breach.tv, iHeartRadio, Spreaker, SoundCloud, iTunes, YouTube, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast service. 
Goods and Beer is a proud member of the HC Universal Network family of podcasts. For more about our sponsors and other podcasts on this network, visit hcuniversalnetwork.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. And until next time, drink responsibly.